Hey guys, welcome into Casey's Corner. Today, we're gonna talk some shit. Can I say that? Okay, today we're gonna talk some poop. We are, we're gonna talk about poop, we're gonna talk about gut health, we're gonna talk about diet culture, and how so many things are affecting what's going on inside of our bodies, inside of our bellies. And today I'm talking with Erin Kenny, who, she's a registered dietitian, but she also has a bunch of other letters at the end of her name that I need her to tell me what they mean. So let's start chatting. There is such a... A revolution or like a, a shift in perspective, I think, too, around the way that people eat and the way that uh, we kind of look at food and diet culture and everything as well. Uh, mm. Now, I want to give everyone a little bit of insight, too, because you have a lot of letters after your name. <laughs> you do. So let's see. MSRD, HCP and CPT. What does all that mean? Other than so a lot of school. <laughs> Other than a lot of school and a lot of money. Yeah. Um, so I'm a registered dietitian. So that's the RD. And I also um, went to get my master's in nutrition science. So that's the MS. And I'm a certified NASM personal trainer. And I'm also a holistic cannabis practitioner. So oh, cool. they are all connected. And, and the reason why I did all of those was to really be able to provide a holistic um, approach to working with one-on-one -on -one with clients because you can't just address the diet without the mental health, the physical activity, all that stuff. Very cool. Well, congratulations for all that training as well. And I'm sure it does help in so many different areas. And what I really love about your feed is that, you know, I follow a lot of intuitive eating coaches and nutritionists and things like that, just for my own resource, resource to have, be, have my own resources. But uh, what I love in your little, in your profile, in your bio is you talk about poop. You talk mm -hmm. about IBS, constipation, all that kind of stuff. And you know what? I know as a woman, my friends and I, we're always talking about like what's going on down there, why our stomach feels so jacked up all the time. So I want to take a second and talk about poop. Okay. Awesome. Well, this is just another part of my day. So let's right. go. Right. So, I mean, IBS, bloating, all that kind of stuff. What are some very traditional common causes that you see? Mm -hmm. So I think one of the biggest things would be stress. Um, and this could be in many different forms. It could be mental health um, issues. It could be physiologic stress, maybe not getting enough sleep. It could be, um, you know, not taking care of yourself in the way of maybe not eating enough or eating at the wrong times. Um, the second one would probably be um, underlying gut imbalances. So SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is actually incredibly common. And uh, a lot of people who are diagnosed with IBS actually have SIBO and they don't know it and they're misdiagnosed. So those are two of the main ones. Um, and then hormones. So hormone imbalance, especially among females, um, you know, our, our gut has receptors for estrogen and progesterone. So anytime that we have um, you know, imbalances in hormones, which a lot of us do, then that is another root cause of digestive issues. I mean, there's definitely so much work that I think gets, uh, that has to go into it, but a lot of things that are getting overlooked by our regular doctor appointments and things like that. Um, are there any kind of common fixes or common things that do help kind of start to alleviate those symptoms and those issues? Yeah, I mean, definitely stress management um, and taking as many things off the plate that are, are a stress to the body, meaning, um, you know, things like artificial sweeteners, things like um, alcohol and uh, not sleeping or, you know, working late at night, things like that. I mean, those, those will benefit all of those populations that, that struggle with digestive issues, no matter what the root cause is. Um, so that's, that's definitely part of it. Um, regular meals and, and quality of those meals is also really important. Again, will benefit all of the populations who are struggling. So that means, you know, getting protein at, at each meal, getting carbohydrates and, and lots of variety of fruits and vegetables and plant foods um, as part of a balanced diet. That is really the foundation of um, optimal gut health. And then we talk about things like omega-3s, which are essential to reducing inflammation in the gut and promoting diversity. Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about probiotics, but that's not kind of a one size fits all, unfortunately. Yeah, that I was curious about that because I, you know, I was actually going to ask you, I feel like the probiotic market is just like blowing up and there's so many things out there. And I feel like 
a lot of people don't know this, that supplements and um, vitamins and things like that don't have any sort of regulation. They can just go out to market. So I think that there's a lot of confusion, a lot of overwhelming feelings um, around kind of where do we even start with what should we be taking to heal our gut health? Because I understand how important it is, but is it more so just around food or are the supplements actually beneficial? So supplements can be really helpful and the most beneficial supplements are the ones in which you're deficient in. And so in my practice, I do blood testing with my clients. So we're not just going to blindly, you know, go to this company and take this gut healing supplement because we're struggling with symptoms. We're going to test the blood or test the stool and then find out what that in individual needs. Now, if you're deficient in vitamin D, for example, vitamin D is a hormone uh, deficiencies associated with much higher rates of IBS, bloating, constipation, irregular bowel movements, then we're going to supplement. So that's a really appropriate situation where someone would really benefit from a supplement. Um, in terms of probiotics, not everybody benefits from taking a probiotic, oh, unfortunately. Okay. Um, there are certain types like maybe a spore-based probiotic that a lot of people might benefit from because it's kind of addressing this uh, depletion that we have in the soil nowadays, which is a whole other topic that we can go wow. into. But, um, you know, there, there is not a one size fits all with probiotics. And also, you know, we just don't have the ability to, to spot, um, treat certain conditions and everyone's microbiome looks different. That's why food is the best way to go with that and getting mm -hmm. fermented foods in your diet and, uh, I'm not to say I, I do use probiotic supplements in my practice, but okay. there isn't, you know, I, I was on Pinterest the other day and I started seeing all these belly pictures. Right. And it yeah. was like this before and after, and then it was an ad for a probiotic. And that definitely can be true. They can be life-changing for some people, but just for listeners, I don't want you to get discouraged or think that right. just taking a probiotic is the fix because it's usually not right. Oh, absolutely. You mentioned fermented foods, uh, personally, one of my favorite food groups, but a lot of people might not be too familiar with it or feel like they have access to it. Give us some examples of really good fermented foods for our gut health. So the best, some of the best fermented foods are things like kimchi, uh, miso, sauerkraut, um, yogurt that's been um, fermented with natural probiotics. Um, those are some of the best sources. And the key here is to get a variety of them because each of them will offer different benefits. And depending on how long something is fermented, which will create a different taste profile, will depend on how diverse the different strains of bacteria and yeast are in that product. So consuming a wide variety is the best. How do you typically incorporate those into your meals? Like what are some of your favorite dishes that have those fermented foods in them? So I love doing like a fried rice with kimchi. That's one of my favorite things. And if someone is looking for like a lower carbohydrate option, um, they might choose like a cauliflower type of rice and make a veggie mixture with that. Um, I love Greek yogurt. It's one of my favorite things to add to a smoothie or I'll have it as a nice high protein snack. Um, and then in terms of the fermented vegetables, my boyfriend and I actually really enjoy putting, um, you know, fermented cabbage or, um, pickled, uh, not pickled, sorry, fermented beets or carrots on top of like a taco, for example, it adds mm. a nice tangy, um, you know, addition to the meal. And it's actually, you know, quite delicious. Now you brought up a good point right there too. Fermented versus pickled. Yes. I caught What's myself. The difference? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so pickled is not, it does not give you the benefits of the probiotic. Mm. So the fermentation process itself is actually what results in these beneficial bacteria growing. When you pickle something, you're basically just putting it in vinegar and that is not, that's not going to provide you with probiotics, unfortunately. Now, for those of you who do like pickles and you struggle to get probiotics in, there are some pickles like actual um, cucumbers that have mm -hmm. been fermented that have a similar taste like a pickle that offer the probiotics. That might be a good place to start if you're new to probiotics. Would that be the same thing as like with sauerkraut too, how there's canned sauerkraut or is that like, where should we be looking for the fermented products? Great question. So the product will typically say fermented and raw. Mm. Okay. So that's a key thing. And then also if you're looking for a yogurt, you want to make sure that the yogurt says contains live active cultures, not just 
made with live active cultures because companies can say, oh yeah, we, we made this product with probiotics, but how much of that is actually making its way into the final source? Oh, such a good tip. I love that. I, I want to ask you about something that you posted earlier this week about cholesterol. And I am mm-hmm. selfishly asking this question, but I know that there's going to be other people out there who can benefit from the answer. So you posted about the difference between diet cholesterol and blood cholesterol and the whole myth around that and how they're related. Can you kind of go into that for a second? Because I'm Mm -hmm. someone who on paper, my blood cholesterol is very high, but I really, the foods that I'm eating don't have a high level of cholesterol. So help Mm -hmm. me out. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. So we, we used to believe, um, that dietary cholesterol would raise our blood cholesterol, which kind of you know, makes sense from just a common sense standpoint of, okay, we used to also think that if we ate fat, it would turn into fat in the body. Now with, you know, the evolution of research, we know that eating cholesterol from things like eggs or shrimp does not actually impact your dietary cholesterol, but there are certain things that do. So some of those things would be uh, saturated fat. So eating, um, you know, a lot of coconut oil. That's a a common one that I see, especially in the health and wellness industry, which coconut oil is not bad, but if you are like spooning it into your coffee or adding it to everything, you know, that can start to be too much saturated fat. Um, also from butter, um, high fat animal products, things like that. So if you do have high cholesterol, then it, it would be worth it to look at reducing your total saturated fat intake. Okay. Um, stress is a big one too. Stress is a a big part of that equation. Um, and then stress could also be in the form of hormonal imbalance. So having, you know, low levels of estrogen, and this is where we start to make the connection between menopause, for example, and how, you know, women who are going through or past menopause have higher cholesterol levels because our body actually uses cholesterol to make those hormones. And when we're not making those hormones anymore and using up that cholesterol, then we might have excess floating around in the blood. Mm. So those are just a few things, alcohol, smoking, you know, dietary choices just as a whole um, can definitely impact it, but don't get too fixated on the the total cholesterol number itself. Although it is important, it's an important part of the picture. We also want to look at your HDL. So your good cholesterol, you know, how, how good is that? And if that is nice and high, then, you know, maybe we're not as concerned about just that total cholesterol being high. And maybe, you know, we're also going to want to know about family history and um, things like that, but chasing individual lab values can cause a lot of anxiety and kind of, you know, lead you down a rabbit hole. It's interesting how you brought up the coconut oil too, because just so people can also understand that these products like coconut oil gets listed as different things too, right? If you're having something with MCT oil, that is also coconut oil. And that's has a high level of saturated fat as well. Correct. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. So there's a lot of different ways that things are labeled uh, that you might not necessarily think, oh, this is a healthy food, but maybe not so healthy for the amount that you're consuming or if you're constantly consuming it. Exactly. Yeah. And that, that really is, it's the unsexy word of balance, right? So people, you know, you say, oh, saturated fat can raise your cholesterol and we find it in coconut oil and people might jump to coconut oil is bad. No, right. Lots of coconut oil being the only source of fat you're using is imbalance. That's all. Yeah. And there is that need for balance. And, you know, looking back, um, I'm a recovering ketoer and I can remember the, you know, the snacks were so heavily based in adding a cup of coconut oil to make this be the binder for this, you know, chocolate bar. And then, the irony as well is then you're using an artificial sweetener on top Mm -hmm. of it. So really these diets are really jacking up the inside of us. And I know that, you know, diets are basically set up to make you fail. Um, What are some tips that you have for breaking away from diet culture and how to avoid the easy traps of like not falling back into it? Mm -hmm. Well, one thing that you actually mentioned, I think is some great advice where you are following people on social media. If that is a a large source of where you're getting information, or if you are a consumer, 
uh, making sure that what you're consuming is actually supportive of what those goals are. And that means, you know, following people who are either evidence-based or people that are promoting having this healthy mindset and, you know, showing that it, it is possible to have a healthy uh, relationship with food without restriction. Um, so that is, that's definitely a big part of it. Um, number two would be addressing any underlying um, traumas or, you know, things that maybe have, you know, come up throughout the course of your life that maybe you haven't dealt with because, mm. you know, our mental health is, is absolutely connected to our physical health and, uh, you know, not having someone to talk to or um, a professional that you can go to who can work through those things, uh, that can actually really impact your health for the, the worse. And so we, we want to make sure that we're addressing the mental health aspect of it too. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my goodness. So what does it look like for a client to come and work with you one-on-one? So I get this question a lot and I do, I do free discovery calls so that people can kind of pick my brain about what it is like to work with me. And people will say they'll, they'll usually word vomit for the first 10 minutes of like, I've been struggling with this. Like I've been to this doctor, I've been to this doctor, no results for this. Um, and then, you know, usually they'll say, how can you help me? And every single client that I work with is receiving very individualized care in the sense that, yes, I do have a, a groundwork for how we begin. And that is always filling in the blanks, basically. So are you, do you have adequate vitamin D? Are you eating balanced meals? Let's get your hydration in check. Let's start focusing on your lifestyle habits. And then, you know, we're going to look at underlying gut imbalances, hormone imbalances, blood testing, things like that, where we might need to dig a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. Um, And then throughout the course of working together, I have clients who we spend the whole time when we meet working on relationship with food. So me maybe debunking some of the things that they've uh, learned throughout the course of their life. Um, Maybe it's coming up with recipes that, uh, uh, you know, kind of work with their busy schedule um, or their you know, preferences for their family members who are picky eaters. Um, so there's a lot. I have clients with autoimmune disorders. I have clients who have disordered relationships with food. So each client um, looks very different. And um, I, I do uh, put a lot of effort into to tailoring their plans for them. So cool. Well, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to wrap up with a question that uh, I have asked lots of my guests. And this is just something, you know, we look back at, the way our lives are now, the choices we've made, and usually there's some sort of rooted, it's rooted somewhere in our upbringing or us as a kid, right? So if you could go back to any age, what age would you go back to? Oh my goodness. I would go back to, I don't know if I know the exact age. I think I was probably around six or seven years old. Um, and that age was so perfect for me because I was so authentically myself and not to say that I'm not now, but I think, you know, as you get older, which I think a lot of people can, you know, sympathize with is, you know, we go through things and we start being influenced by other people, but I would say that was kind of the prime age for me. Um, you know, I, I wore whatever I wanted to, I've always focused on comfort. My neighbors used to call my mom and be like, we just had an Erin sighting. She's in a cow pajama, like running across the street. Uh, that really just embodies like who I truly am. Um, and so I love that. I love that stage in my life. And I also, technology was not a thing for us, you know, spent hours outside and I've really come back to love that in my life is spending more time outside. So that's probably the age that I would go back to. What do you think six-year-old Erin needs to hear? Ooh, she needs to hear that she's not lactose intolerant. She has some major gut imbalances that need to be resolved. Um, My digestive issues started at a very young age. Um, And she'd probably also need to hear um, that there's no need to be anxious about life, that, you know, everything will work out and anxiety is not um, the solution. It's funny, 34 year old Casey needs to hear that a lot of times too. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was easy for me to come up with it because it's, you know, to say I'm not dealing with it now would be a yeah. lie, but therapy yeah. is great. So totally big fan of therapy. Absolutely. Big fan. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, thank you so much for hanging out. I appreciate it. Can you tell everyone where they can find you? Absolutely. So it's um, nutritionrewired.com is my website, and you can find my podcast, um, information about my one on one and group coaching there. Um, cookbooks and all that stuff. 
Awesome. And we'll link everything below as well. Erin, thank you so much for hanging out. Thanks for having me. See you soon. All right. Bye. Bye. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. (laughs) I'm glad this worked out. Yeah, totally. And I love like, you know, I kind of only dove into a few questions because what I would love to be able to do with my guests is like keep bringing them back and, you know, having different topics to share. Yeah, absolutely. Well, anytime, let me know. Awesome. Thank you. Have a great week. You're welcome. You too, Casey. Bye. Bye.